Hello, and uh, welcome again to another one of our Cromwellian conversations. Uh, my name's Stuart, I'm the curator of the Cromwell Museum in Huntington. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you here again as we're discussing another aspect of 17th century history from the time of the British Civil Wars in the mid-17th century and the life and times of Oliver Cromwell. Um, the Cromwell Museum in Huntington has the best collection in the world of items relating to Cromwell, who we recognise as one of the most controversial and divisive figures in British history. Uh, it's not our job to be his kind of fan club, if you like. Uh, we basically tell his story warts and all using this amazing collection of original objects that are relating to him and this incredibly significant period in British history. What I do this afternoon is talk about a particular anniversary. I'm recording this on the afternoon of the 15th of June 2020 and yesterday the 14th of June it was the 375th anniversary of the Battle of Naseby. And Naseby was really the turning point in the first English Civil War. Um, it fought on the 14th of June 1645 uh, at uh, the, the battlefield which is about 10-50 miles south of Market Harbour. Uh, it's in Northamptonshire. Uh, the site is still there today and it's actually relatively unchanged if you go to the Naseby battlefield as it is now as it would have been in 1645. There's also a set of very good interpretation panels around the battlefield that bring the story of the battlefield to life for people. Up until Naseby, there really wasn't a, a sort of, you know, going to be a clear, decisive blow during the Civil Wars, which by that point had dragged on for nearly three years. Uh, for much of the early part of the Civil War, the Royalists had been in the ascendancy um, over the last year or so beforehand. Both Parliament and the King had both won victories. However, this was something different. At the Battle of Naseby, the Parliamentarian New Modelled Army, commanded by Sir Thomas Fairfax, numbering somewhere in the region of 14,500 men, faced a Royalist army commanded by the King himself, uh, aided by Prince Rupert, probably numbering around about 10,000 men in total. Uh, the Royalist Army was all composed of veteran soldiers. Uh, the new modelled army was a new untested force. Some of the troops involved in it were uh, experienced soldiers, particularly the Parliamentarian cavalry, um, who were commanded by a certain gentleman by the name of Oliver Cromwell. Um, however, a lot of the infantry were untried and either raw recruits or in some cases actually uh, deserters from the Royalist forces who'd been persuaded to change and uh, fight for par under Parliamentarian command instead. So it's a, a significant sort of turning point in this, uh, as I say, this, this sort of what is today quiet valley in Northamptonshire. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about the battle itself. Um, we do actually have a really good animation inside the museum, if you come and visit us, which actually explains what happened to the Battle of Naseby. And it takes an original illustration, which uh, is this illustration you can see here, uh, which was produced in a book published in 1647, um, written by a man called Joshua Sprigg. Sprigg had been at, present at the Battle of Naseby, where he'd been a chaplain in the New Modelled Army, so he was an eyewitness to these events. He uh, published a book on the events of the uh, Battle of Naseby and indeed the New Model Army's campaigns in 1647 called Anglia Redivivia, basically translates as England's recovery from the Latin title there, in which he described what happened at the battle and we have this amazing engraving that you can see here which uh, gives an overview of what the battle would have looked like. It's hugely significant, not only for the point of view of the Battle of Naseby, but it's a very rare illustration of what a Civil War battle actually looks like. Uh, artists in this period didn't really tend to do paintings of battles. Most of the illustrations we have of Civil War battles are actually Victorian, led are much later on and therefore not necessarily terribly accurate. Um, art in the 17th century was very much about portraiture and landscapes and still lifes and that sort of thing. They weren't really painting battle paintings or battle illustrations. So there are very, very few illustrations and certainly nothing as detailed and as comprehensive as this that gives us an indication of what a, a Civil War battle would have looked like. Now, um, as I say, inside the Cromwell Museum, we've actually got an animation of this particular illustration, uh, which was done by one of our volunteers, and it's very, very clever. It brings to life the battle and, and what happened as part of the, the different steps within it. Uh, suffice to say, by the end of the battle, uh, it was a parliamentarian victory. Um, around about uh, a thousand royalists were killed and about 5,000 were taken prisoner. 
Um, also, there was a, a number of uh, casualties, particularly amongst the Royalist baggage train, uh, one of the more uh, dark parts of the battle, other than the fighting itself, was that afterwards the parliamentarian forces uh, captured the Royalist baggage train and killed a number of the civilians they found inside. Uh, quite who the civilians were is disputed, whether they were Irish, whether they were Welsh, and simply the um, parliamentarian soldiers thought they were Irish. And it's part of the ethnic hatred that existed in many parts of England and unfortunately towards Irish Catholics in this particular period and uh, around about a hundred of the, the civilians in the baggage train were killed as a result. Um, the battle itself was hugely significant for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, it's worth pointing out that uh, Oliver Cromwell, although he was very significant in the battle, uh, was not the commander of the Parliament's forces. Uh, Cromwell had helped create the new modelled army. Um, by the way, notice that I'm using the phrase new modelled army. Um, you'll see it referred to in history books often as new model, but that's a Victorian term for it. At the time, it was referred to as the army or the army new modelled. So in our interpretation, we tend to use in the museum new modelled army as a term for it. So this was a new kind of army that had been formed uh, by Parliament in the autumn of 1644, spring of 1645, um, in a response to try and uh, find a way of winning the war and breaking through what previously had been about fighting between different regional armies. Um, Cromwell had been instrumental in the foundation of this, not in the terms of the army itself, but in terms of the new officer structure. Um, he had pushed through in the autumn of 1644, spring of 1645, what was known as the self-denying ordinance in Parliament. And basically this required the sacking or the resignation of any officers who held uh, were either constituencies as MPs or members of the House of Lords. Up to that point, many of the officer class in Parliament's army have been there as political appointments rather than because of their military competency and therefore it was part of the uh, political program of Cromwell and a number of his colleagues to get rid of the, the dead wood as they saw it. Of course actually this technically included Cromwell himself although at the last minute of course there was uh, an exemption put in that any officers who were deemed to be competent could be reappointed and surprise surprise that involved Oliver Cromwell. Uh, however, pushing this through Parliament meant that uh, Cromwell wasn't necessarily involved with the foundation of the new modelled army itself, which was founded and put together, as I say, from a combination of existing parliamentary forces, some new royal recruits, um, some also the recruits were actually uh, royalist prisoners of war who were persuaded to change sides. And the idea was to create a new kind of army that was more professionally trained, equipped, better organised, better officered, uh, more standardised equipment, and for the first time the whole army had a standardised coat colour, and for the simple reason that it was uh, cheap, and uh, for no other reason than that they used red coats. And of course the red coat stuck and is still worn by the dress uniform of the British Army even today. Um, the, uh, the troops in the new modelled army were trained by their new commander, Sir Thomas Fairfax, who'd been a very successful commander in the north of England during the early part of the Civil War. Uh, Fairfax was a very experienced commander. He was very um, inspirational to his, to his troops, uh, thoroughly respected for all by them and led from the front. Uh, he was also an experienced soldier, having fought on the continent in the Thirty Years' War. And it's Fairfax, really, who deserves much of the credit winning the first and indeed second civil wars for Parliament. He tends to get airbrushed from history a little bit, unfortunately, because of Cromwell's later significance. And he, with his infantry commander, Sir Philip Skip, raised, trained and organised a new modelled army. So they were an untrained, or rather untried and untested force um, for the first time when they, they engaged the Royalist forces at Naseby. And uh, therefore it was a real blooding for them. Afterwards, they became consistently victorious. Victorious. It gave the, kind of the, the um, confidence to carry on and win the war. The battle was also a turning point uh, as a disaster for the Royalist forces. Significant casualties, and uh, not only casualties, but also soldiers captured. Um, around about half the King's army were lost, either by killed, wounded, or in many cases taken prisoner, including most significantly his infantry, many of whom were very experienced and veteran soldiers, and the Royalist corps would feel their loss very keenly. Um, it was also um, a sort of turning point from the point of view of uh, propaganda. 
only did, of course, it give a sort of decisive victory that sort of Parliament's news books could kind of crow from the rooftops. But also, of course, it was hugely important because at the end of the battle, the King's baggage train was captured. The King's cabinet uh, proved to be a huge propaganda coup for Parliament. Many of the letters were revealed to show the king negotiating with uh, foreign powers and uh, therefore showed that, uh, or began to sort of uh, put across the image that the king couldn't be trusted, that he was prepared to do anything in order to make sure that he maintained his throne. Real sort of turning point in the Civil War, although at the time it appeared that the war would drag on for much longer and of course it still went on for another year. In terms of Cromwell himself, he was present at the battle, only appointed to be commander of Par the Parliament's cavalry in the new modelled army about 10 days before the battle, and literally only arrived with the army a few days beforehand. Um, so he was very much a late appointment. The day of the battle itself, though, he was hugely significant. He advised Fairfax that perhaps they should draw upon a ridge line where it would invite the Royalists to attack. Uh, he sent uh, dragoons mounted infantry round onto one of the flanks in order to provide supporting fire against the Royalist cavalry when they attacked. And uh, his cavalry on the right wing of the Parliamentarian army played a decisive role, driving off not only their opposing Royalist forces, but providing his uh, traditional reserves to swing round and engage the Royalist infantry and indeed break uh, much of the uh, Royalist army. So Cromwell did play a significant part of the battle, but he wasn't in charge, it wasn't his victory, and Fairfax deserves much of the credit for what happened. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview over why the Battle of Naseby is significant. Um, if you want to find out more, do have a look at both the Naseby Battlefield Projects website and also that of the Battlefields Trust, both which contain a lot more information about the battle and also how to explore it if you want to go and visit the site. Uh, now lockdown is relaxing in the UK, um, you can go and explore the battlefield itself. There's trails around the site, interpretation panels and various monuments there. Uh, also, as lockdown begins to relax, hopefully in the next few weeks the Cromwell Museum will be reopening. Uh, so do get the chance to come and have a look and uh, see our displays as well, which includes, as I say, an animation that explains what happened at the Battle of Naseby, as well as our original copy of Anglia Redivivia on display. Um, in the meantime, um, I hope you stay safe during this particular lockdown period and again from the coronavirus. Uh, if you have enjoyed this video, please do uh, remember to like the video. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube as well. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, the links are in the title card at the end of this uh, particular video. There's also details if you'd like to donate to the museum. We are an independent charity, so any donations that help us continue our work are gratefully appreciated. Otherwise, please stay safe and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.